We all need exercise. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, so Carl Grossman, who's with us. Everyone, a round of applause for Carl Grossman. He lives here in Sag Harbor. Andy Refkin with the New York Times. And of course, Josh Fox. So is there anything you want, we're going to start with Andy. We're going to have like maybe some opening remarks before we get to some questions. Andy, is there anything you want to begin with? Any comment you want to make well, about the film? It's a very powerful film, as was the first one. Um, if I had to characterize it, I would characterize it and it looks like it's sort of one way. I mean, it's a polemic more than a journalistic kind of matter. And I don't think that that's a negative thing. You're making a case. It's like a courtroom of summation. Some lawyers are right, some lawyers are wrong. And sometimes there's differences in between, and it's, it's powerful stuff. Um, you know, I come at these issues looking at all the layers, and there are many other layers I would love to see whether the neighbors and workers who did it buy out, who did it sell out. I don't see any of them on the screen. Uh, I know there's complexity is not there. And I think, you know, the reality of our energy issues as a country against planet is they're complex. And I, again, I think it's powerful. I think it's harder to be. This is worse. In that way, it's invalid because it's identifying problems that are not what otherwise gain attention. Um, but I just so want my sense is that people have to understand that this is our case uh, from one, I don't want to say one side. Our, our, there's a prismatic nature of our energy and climate change, and so it's not even like a either or thing. That's all it is. Carl. Uh, yeah, I would like to speak. And most of you probably are familiar with my work writing a column in Long Island newspapers or doing investigative reporting with WVVH-TV. But my full-time job as a professor of journalism for 35 years at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury, where I teach investigative reporting. It's supposed to be the oldest such course in the country. And, and just let me say from that perspective, what I've just seen and you've just seen is, is a monument to great investigative reporting. <laughs> When I heard, first heard that Josh was going to do Gasland 2, having seen Gasland 1, and was just bowled over by, was so, is so great, I wondered how is he going to follow Gasland with Gasland 2? He has, it's as good as the original. In some ways, it's, it's even kind of better because you've gone broader, wider, it, it's full. I, I disagree with, 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 with all due respect with Andrew. You've hit all the bases. I mean, what do you need? Another talking head denying, uh, you know? I mean, it, it is all there with, with great sweep and he cut through the complexity with uh, uh, just perfection. And I just, just would like to conclude by noting something very important to me. He gets to the point with Jacobson, who did this very important study, Scientific American, which is not exactly a radical publication. In 2009, its cover story was, I have it right here, a plan to power 100% of the planet with renewables. And that Professor Jacobson was one of the authors of that very important report. And essentially, that report in Scientific American, and it's been now replicated by many very important institutions. Uh, concluded you don't need fracking, you don't need nuclear, you don't need coal, you don't need oil, you don't need any of natural gas, so-called. We can, we can have energy we can live with. Simple, well, just, let me just read the subhead from Scientific American. Wind, water, and solar technologies can provide 100% of the world's energy, a limit, and so forth and so on. So what you've just seen is something, I mean, Go home to the city on Monday on the Long Island Expressway, that's a risk. Certain risks we take, you take a plane to California, that might be a risk. Maybe safer, maybe not safer than driving on Route 80. But this is a risk totally unnecessary, totally outrageous, and totally deadly. All right, let me... <clears throat> um, I, I just want to mention in a prefatory way that uh, I did another program like this with Josh. We screened the uh, first gas land up in Syracuse. Uh, uh, I have some family that live up there. We went up and did this program at the Landmark Theater. And similar to that 
program, uh, we, we had the same set of circumstances, although some differences, where we, we asked industry people to come and be on the panel. And we wanted, you know, scientific, we wanted geologists or hydrologists, we wanted, we wanted scientists. We, uh, they came back to us with a filmmaker uh, uh, who did Fractnation, Fal it's, it's pronounced Phelan McAleer. So th this guy who is the, uh, uh, the filmmaker, uh, we, ch we chose not to have him because we, cause we, 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 we weren't having Fox here as a filmmaker per se, we were having him as an Academy Award nominated filmmaker. We thought there was a difference because this is a film festival. So we wanted to counter uh, uh, his claims or balance the program with people from the industry. And it is 4th of July weekend. Uh, we're grateful for the people that could come out here. Uh, uh, HBO is screening the film, so they brought Josh and his group out here. And we're grateful to them for that. But it was very complicated to get people to come here this weekend, during this holiday weekend. But we did get uh, 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 Andy Revkin to come out and thank you. But we want you to know that we, we reached out to all these industry sources and said, send us a scientist. I want somebody to give us the science. And they were unwilling or unable to do that. In fact, in Syracuse, I said, I have to complete this panel and I have to set the number of people on the stage and balance the panel. Will you let us know by a certain date if you're going to have someone come? The date came and went. We never heard from them. And then afterward, they said Alec Baldwin blocked us from being part of the panel when we told them that the panel was closed after that day because I had to have four competent people to do the program. So there's a lot of game. Whether you're for fracking or you're against fracking uh, or you're indifferent, uh, there's a lot of game playing that goes on with the public relations here. And this, this, this leads to my first question for for Josh, which is that, um, you know, the point is made about Hill and Knowlton and the denial process that was used in the, the denial strategy that was used in the tobacco uh, campaign. And obviously that's what these guys, the offensive playbook they're running with. Do they continue with that now? Is denial still part of it? Or do they admit that there is uh, toxification of the water? Well, before I answer, I just uh, wanted to say, first of all, Alec, thank you so much for having us here. This is amazing to be in the Hamptons, to be at the Hamptons International Film Festival. Thank you to the Hamptons International Film Festival. Also here in the audience, we have Trish Adlesic, um, a producer of Gasland and one of the producers of Gasland too. I just want to acknowledge her for her great work. Um, my stepmother is in the audience also, which is kind of awesome. Um, and there are all of her friends who just left. And you know, it continues um, daily, in fact. Um, daily we hear um, these attacks on the film um, and they are coming from a lot of different angles. There is actually a video that just got circulated that stated that the Lipsky family faked their water contamination, um, which is outrageous. And um, there was a piece published in the Daily Kos by a contributing writer that said n the Society of Petroleum Engineers never said that there was 35 percent leakage and then we sent them the PowerPoint which has the Society of Petroleum Engineers logo and the person who published it. Um, it was an internal document and so what they've done right now is and as they have done for the last several years is just resort to out and out lying and obfuscation and do that in a lot of different ways whether it's letters to the editors or as you probably know if you watch television the ubiquitous commercials for Energy Tomorrow, for the American Natural Gas Alliance, that you see hundreds of millions of dollars being spent um, to try to convince the American people to drill the continent into Swiss cheese. And this is what we're seeing again and again and again. I just went on the Chris Hayes show, and um, they uh, ran natural gas ads during my interview. I mean, you know, and then when you go online, if you want to watch that, the banner ad is from Shell, the company that kick the G family off of four generations, uh, four generations uh, property that they've been on forever. Um, it is an all on, all out frontal assault. And the, the strategy lately has been to say, oh, well, the media has to present both sides. And therefore, that's a trap. Because if one side is just lying all the time, um, as for example, in your column, when you decided that it was somehow appropriate to include this other filmmaker whose film is completely untrue in every way and put that on a, par on a, on a parody with investigative journalism. 
when, in fact, in the New York Times, there was this whole series of investigative reports that supported the film that was actually triggered by the film. But let me just finish and say that this is the strategy, that there is this idea that there's a debate going on. And when you put out someone who's just an industry spokesperson, like the tobacco industry did, and they said, oh, smoking is healthy for you, it's good for you. Um, and then you can stave off decades of action with people. So we felt this was important to bring out, as well as the fact that there's all this stuff that we probably don't know about. This PSYOPs report, the gas industry having its own internal conversation, um, recorded by a reporter um, who was a blogger, an anti-fracking blogger. But we don't know, that was two and a half years ago. We don't know what are the next steps. And now that we see um, a lot of revelations coming out about all the ways in which um, we're being listened to, it's chilling to me when you see the Homeland Security report, how they were giving information directly to the industry without um, uh, letting anybody know that it was a leak that brought that out. So now, there's a lot of these tactics that are happening that are still going on that are, that are really underhanded, but have the semblance of being legitimate. And that's what's really scary about them. The, the, now, I want to get Andrew's response to that, but I want to have, first have you answer this question, which is, how long have you been studying this issue, or, or I should say, and or reporting on this issue? And what, how would you say your view of it has evolved over the last several years? Because, I mean, this is for Andrew, uh, 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 has evolved over the last several years, and, and how would you distill it down to what's your evaluation of it right now? Well, just to get back to that prism of analogy, there's no single issue here. I mean, I've been writing about global warming, greenhouse gas and climate change since 1988. 6,000-word cover story, 1992, my first book on global warming. So on the issues related to global warming and the contributions to natural gas or coal or uh, other forms of energy and the options we have for energy, um, I've got a deep and long uh, history. and. And frankly, there, the uh, reality that natural gas is dirtier um, than coal in the climate context is just not going to hold up. And I have been face to face, Tony and Ann, about power, with a room full of other scientists from Cornell. Because this is not false balance. There, there was uh, uh, the guys who were published in the same literature that they published in who deeply questioned their conclusions about the role of natural gas and global warming. But going back, don't take my word for this. Go to realclimate.org, one of the most respected websites for training the real science on global warming, and look and put in the word methane, which is what natural gas is. And read what they said, which is that CO2 and coal are still the gorilla in the room going forward, especially. And one thing that I think is really vital, you know, and this is a very powerful portrait of the feelings and views of people who are on the front lines being directly affected by this journey. I've been with them to some extent, and that's an area I've been to Bradford, to uh, those counties in Pennsylvania. And it's clear, you know, it's an industrial process being superimposed on essentially a largely rural landscape, and it's an incredibly jarring, disturbing um, thing from that standpoint. So for them, the arguments about global warming will never have salience, that, that, that gas is uh, no, no, let me just make note that natural gas is better than coal. In other words, shifting from coal to natural gas is good if you care about the climate system and a way going forward as a, as a transition toward whatever. You, you agree with that? And, uh, well, I'm, no, saying, I'm asking him. Uh, that natural gas is a, is a step in the right direction. It's a decarbonization. There's one C and four H's in a molecule. You're that. putting me to sleep. That, well, that's the problem with this issue. And by the way, all of you who came here today walked through town uh, where all those shops, their 90 degree day and the air conditioning is blasting, you're asleep on that front too, unless you're there saying to the shop owner, you know, you're wasting energy, you're contributing to this problem. It's a red herring. Say it. That's a red herring. No. It's well, let's, 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 yeah, let's, let's, but, let's, 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 let well, let's, let's, have, let's have the program first. We're, we're, in, a huge, huge, we're in a huge show in bags of pig blood on each other here. Hold on. Let's, um, let's hold on. But, 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 but I want to focus on one thing you said, which is it seems to me that you sound as if way, the method. Pardon me? I didn't say I'm four. Well, no, it's not about four, but you, it's, it, you seem to put the emphasis on, I mean, based on what you just said, the, the, the methane, uh, uh, the, 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 the methane escape. 
the venting of methane from the process. And when I watch the film, I see that it's the death of several cuts, meaning they talk about the fracturing is going to lead to tectonic problems and, and, and geological problems and possible earthquakes. They talk about... Well, the thing, well, well, we don't know that, but I'm well, saying... What's the question? San Andreas Fault. What was that about? The Monterey Shale play runs over, right over the San Andreas Fault. Was there anything in the National Academy of Sciences report on, on drilling and, and, and that related to that level of earthquakes? The, well, the earthquakes in Arkansas that are coral... The, we have lots of evidence of how fracking causes earthquakes and uh, injection wells. Is that going to trigger the big one in California? I, I don't believe that's what I said in the film, but I did... But, but is it Let's wrong? Let's go back to, but, but, to but, 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 but I want to, you change the subject, for, but I want to get, I want to get, finish what you just said. Well, no, no, what, what he said was in the film was hydraulic fracturing potentially triggered lots of earthquakes in Arkansas, and is it safe Not to assume? potentially, that was. It did, did trigger lots of earthquakes in Arkansas. So is it safe to assume that fracking might accomplish the same thing in California? You find that unreasonable? Wait, 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 you find that unreasonable? Where did they say that? You can look it up. Right. Sure. No, no, I'm not going to take your word for it. So they said that hydraulic fracturing will have no effect on the earthquake. No, they would never say nothing. Oh. Right. What, what did they say specifically? As he said, it would be useful. Oh. Can you distill it for us? That, that there's no evidence that fracking will cause that kind of earthquake. Okay. No, so just, but, to get, but to get back to what you said was, so then the other thing that was mentioned was that this fracturing process will cause contaminated water to have the ability to migrate into clean water. That the, that the whole hydrological dynamic underneath the ground where there was water that existed in one body can, and was, go, go, go ahead. Can we get back to the climate change question? Can we get back to the climate change question? So this, and this is, I'm sorry if we, if we, don't, want, we don't want to put anybody to sleep, but I'm, I'm wondering what are the numbers that you're working from? Because the devil's in the details here. Because the way this works, as you saw in the film, Natural gas burns about half of the amount of CO2 as coal. But methane, in the 20-year time period, is up to 105 times more potent in the atmosphere as a warming agent than CO2, but which means... It's not about the 20-year time frame. It, well, we reach two degrees warming by 2042, which is 20, 29 years from now. So the quickest way to get this planet cooler now to extend the window where we can operate is to take methane out of the atmosphere because it heats it up faster and it disperses faster. If we're talking about anything more than 1% methane leakage in the field of total production, you're at greater than coal in the 20 year time frame and equal to coal in the 100 year time frame. What we're seeing in the field, the measurements that are in the field are between 7 and 17% leakage total of total production. You're going to shake my head. You're going to shake your head at NOAA. You're going to shake your head at peer-reviewed science. Well, well, NOAA what we have do, in the field, we well, but which is, right which is fine. Agree but what we, but but what's happening right now in the media, and this is crazy, that the week before this film uh, comes out, President Obama came forward and unveiled a climate plan. The climate plan advocated a wholesale switching from coal-fired power plants to gas-fired power plants, which means and liquefied natural gas, sending it overseas, and exporting the technology of fracking all over the world through this Global Shale Gas Initiative, which they have renamed it to something unconventional, something or other. Um, and so the fabulous, talking, wonderful energy plan. Well, so when you're talking about our choices for energy, we're, when we're talking about fracking, we're talking about building 50 years worth of infrastructure for 50 more years of natural gas. When you're talking about what I know of in the field, seeing what I'm seeing, knowing what, and the studies that continue to come out are showing much, much more methane being vented off into the atmosphere than is estimated by EPA. The EPA just lowered their estimates. Why? Because they did field measurements? Because they saw, oh, we're measuring methane in the air and methane is actually going down. No, they lowered their estimates because industry told them to. Because industry went into EPA and said, oh, we think our, <laughs> our methane leakage is lower. And EPA said, ah, okay, we'll lower them. That was direct industry pressure. It had nothing to do with science. It had nothing to do with the things that we both care about, which is peer-reviewed science. Um, so when we're talking about global warming and climate change, 
the answer is not let's tie ourselves into 50, 60 year, more years of frack gas. Let's challenge the American people. And what we're seeing as we go around the country, we just went and did a 25 city tour in six states. Um, we, we ended it in Pittsburgh with 1,700 people watching this film, screaming and cheering from the, the whole region. We, we, we were in Williamsport, PA the night before, a town of 30,000 people in central Pennsylvania. We had 850 people in that audience. Those people are starting to care about climate change right now. And that dialogue is happening in central Pennsylvania. And it is remarkable to watch people in the Tea Party and the tree huggers be on the same stage and go, yes, you know what? We've got to care about climate change right now or else we're going to get fracked. Just, uh, in 2009, I wrote a page on the story for the New York Times about leakage of gas, you know, methane leakage from the gas business, and about best practices, which can make companies money if they do them, and about, also about industry culture, which resists those best practices because it's cheaper to drill new wells than fix the old ones, and, and, and about EPA's good plan to try to move toward making the best practices which controls about 50% of those emissions. And if you're at 7% leakage rate, that brings you down to about 3.5, which still makes it, if you're at that low. So now we're putting everybody to sleep with the technical numbers. No, we're not. Okay, good. All right. Here's where it gets really impressive. Go to Russia. I wish you would go. Go to Russia. Uh, where there was a Canadian gas expert who went to Russia and told me that one compression station, a single apparatus on Russia's uh, frontier of its conventional natural gas facilities was emitting more methane to the air than all of Canada's distribution lines combined. Right. Right. And I mean, so all of that we see here, you know, what I, and, and again, I'm not for any of these practices. I do see a lot of innovation underway right now. Uh, some students from Duke University started a company to put a tag in what cracking fluid that's for. Basically, it has a fingerprint, so if there's ever some issue... Did industry oppose that? No, I don't care. See, I don't care, but it's industry will have... Well, to well, no, but we, well, we have to care because industry, uh, okay. what I've heard is, and what I've read is, industry is opposed to that. It's like, it's, like the, it's like the bullet companies don't want you to mark the bullets either, you know. Because of the concerns of the rising communities, the EPA will move toward requiring different standards. It's too slow, and I've criticized President well, why, why, why do you have that faith in the EPA that they're going to do that? Because I see the directionality, and I see... What, the you see that EPA... This is a newsflash. Okay. The last case in Wyoming, the form that I got arrested trying to... This, just happened. this happened last week. EPA announced that it was turning the investigation over to the state of Wyoming that had been openly hostile to the investigation from the beginning, with a $1.5 million contribution to finance the investigation by the drilling company being investigated. This is not good. How do you think that's going to turn out? We do not have an EPA administrator right now. We do not know what Gina McCarthy's position is, but I do think it's very telling that our uh, person, who I do believe was vigorously and aggressively investigating fracking, and Lisa Jackson resigned right after the, the election. These are not good signs. Um, currently, right now, I, the, 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 the thank you that I wanted to give above and beyond yours and this festival was to the people of New York for standing up to the gas industry. Five years ago, five years ago, we were told, you're never going to keep the gas industry out of New York. We were told that it is never going to happen. Well, guess what? New Yorkers provided a path to the world. Because of you. Well, no, that's not true. Be because of Alec Baldwin? But no, because, because of all of the, no, no, this was, and, and you don't understand what happened in this, in this state. You guys reinvented democracy to make this work. You hounded all over, I'm not saying you personally, but New Yorkers hounded all over the DEC. Walter Hang had a huge, but there were, there's an anti-fracking organization in every tiny little town all throughout New York State. Adrian Esposito is in the house of Citizens Campaign for the Environment, an, an amazing group that's, this was something unprecedented. 204,000 public comments is more people than voted for Andrew Cuomo in his home borough of Queens. It's more people than voted for Andrew Cuomo in the entire southern tier. That's the last record for in comments on an environmental impact study in New York State pre-fracking was a thousand. If you go on YouTube, it's absolutely. If amazing. you go on YouTube, you can see us calling Cuomo. We, yeah. we held up the phone to the audience, 500 people at the Landmark Theater, 
and that we got a number with a recording for his special aid about the fracking thing. And we said, and I said, hello, Governor Cuomo, it's Alec Baldwin calling. Uh, we have a message for you from 500 of your constituents here in Onondaga County. How many of you want, if you clap if you do not want hydraulic fracturing? And all the people screamed into the phone. I was like, okay, thank you, Andrew. Call me back, okay? Call me back as soon as you can. Boop. Did he ever call you back? <clears throat> he never called me back. No, he never called me back. But uh, 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 go right ahead. Uh, in terms Her. of um, the Obama administration, a very disturbing development. Obama's choice as the new energy secretary, Eugene Moniz, is a, a huge booster of fracking and a huge booster of nuclear power, too. And just going back to the point I tried to make earlier, I, I think comparing fracking with coal, you know, trying to create that comparison, is like not where it is. Uh, as the film quite well said, safe fracking is an oxymoron, like safe tobacco is an oxymoron, like safe nuclear is an oxymoron. And where our energy literally has to go is to these technologies now available, now here, that can provide all the energy, all the power that's, we need. That's the biggest myth of all. I don't that's believe so. What, what's the myth? That renewables can somebody can fast forward our, our way to a non-carbon uh, economy. That is possible. Mark Jacobson, I, I just wrote about his new paper, his recent paper on New York. Going and he and he re, and he rebutted you after that. And then he's printed his rebuttal. A new paper came out, and he's challenging it, and that's science. But here's the deal. Um, his paper and the National Renewable Energy Laboratories study that charted a cap to 80% of the United States production, you know, moved to renewables by 2050 or so. They, don't, they specifically exclude the realities of politics, economics, and, and all this stuff, which means, and by the way, that's why I. We're here! This is politics. Know, exactly. This is reality. What I'm witnessing across New York State, and I'm sorry to cut you off, is a movement for renewable energy that needs enthusiasm. And that's why I wanted you here. But if you I wanted you here to say, come on, but Amy, but let's do this. Him, if, you, if you subtract, which, which I'm, I'm respecting that you're saying that it's impossible to do this, but, no, but, no, no, but hypothetically, if you subtract the politics slash economics of it, and you, and, you, and you say on a technological level, Technologically, do we have the ability right now for renewables to power 80% of the United States' That's power needs? Right. But we have these visions and <clears throat> we have these needs. You know, uh, again, I cook on propane in the house off the grid. I don't know what you guys cook on. What do you cook on? Out here, whale oil. We use whale oil out here in the Hamptons. <laughs> and, and here in Where the hell are you from, man? We're in East Hampton. We use whale oil. I mean, come on. Everybody knows that. Those corn dogs you had before? And beer. We use beer, too. We cook with beer. Anyway, what were you saying? And let me speak about the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I I've visited it. I've written about it bunches of times. It's in Golden, Colorado. I suggest you visit it if you're around the Boulder area. You go there, and you go to the one division they do. Sunlight hits water, creates hydrogen. And the scientists, they said, right, right to my camera, all the energy the world ever needs could come from this, uh, this process of solar water. Then you go to the thin film photovoltaic. They were pioneers in this whole new technology of thin film, like sheets of photovoltaic panels. And the scientists said, and, and again, this is not somebody with a goat in Vermont. I thought there's anything wrong with that. Uh, telling you that... All the energy the world ever needs can come from thin film photovoltaic. Coating skyscrapers in Manhattan. Uh, Manhattan become, can become an energy sink in and of itself. You go to the, where the wind turbine people are, and they were actually been pioneers in the, the, the offshore wind turbine designs, the new architecture of wind turbines. All the energy the world ever needs can come from, from wind. You go, to the, you go on and on, division after division. Now, they're obviously not all right. But altogether, that mix, whether it's wind and photovoltaic and the hydrogen, altogether, they can, the technology is here today. And maybe we shouldn't call it a but, Manhattan project. We should call it maybe a Bronx project. An Apollo project. This time, but we could get there, and we can get there very rapidly, and we can get away with this monstrous rape of the planet. Well, I'm gonna, but, but, but I, I want to just add that in this, in this path toward renewables, toward 
a more uh, conscientious and comprehensive use of renewables to keep in mind that for me the biggest issue <coughs> with fracking and this is the same and there, there are uh, comparisons to this in nuclear and Carl and I have done a lot of work with groups uh, uh, to, to try, try to shut down nuclear reactors along the east coast here that are utility reactors and that is that eventually when things do go wrong like, you know, for me, you watch this movie and the thing, and everybody, we have, all have our own experience. And what keeps coming to me and washing over me, no pun intended, when I watch the film is that this stuff doesn't contaminate the water. It does contaminate the water. It does contaminate the water. And then these people come to who to solve that problem? Who do they come to to solve that problem? They come to the federal government. They come to you and I to clean up their mess. They come to you and I to pay. They're going to ask us to pay. You and I paid to send troops to the Middle East and kill people for oil. We didn't kill people for democracy. We didn't kill people because we put a hit out on Saddam Hussein. We didn't put a hit on these people because they were behind 9-11. We did it for oil, and you paid for that, a trillion dollars. Now, if you took that money, if you, and, if you took, and if you took that money and you diverted that money toward, as we were saying, the Apollo project of renewable energy where you've got, I mean, who, I mean, is everybody here doesn't see that there's all the solar power you need in the southwestern United States. I've got people who I work with, who I rely on, meaning I've had to really work my way through this network to find reliable sources, who said to me, there's wind uh, power capacity, there's wind turbine capacity. On derricks they could build on the Great Lakes alone. They don't have to go out into the ocean to really, really raging, you know, difficult waters. On the, on the Great Lakes alone, there's enough wind power to power a third of the United States, a third of the country. So this technology is there. The only thing that's lacking is the will. And this is what upsets me and disturbs me, is we have the will for other things. We have the will to send a lot of people halfway around the world to go die, and, and we foot the bill of a trillion dollars for that. I'm from Long Island. I grew up on Long Island. And out where I'm from, in, from Massapequa, they were going to put wind turbines off the coast of Jones Beach State Park and the town beaches there. And the people complained and complained and complained. And I thought, man, if you put wind turbines out here in Montauk, if you put, I mean, I'm not talking about thousands of them, but if you had an array of them somewhere st strategically located, I mean, to me, those would be like looking at the Statue of Liberty. Those would represent freedom for this country from this terrible tyranny we've had to live under. Anyway, go ahead. So Mark Jacobson right now is working on a report, and it's in the peer review process, I think, right now. Wind turbines actually break apart hurricane winds. And he's done these calculations of how you could mitigate some of the effects of the next Sandy if you had wind turbines along exactly what you mentioned. Um, it's pretty astounding. It's, so look out for that. Um, but. And the Jacobson plan for New York, which he wrote um, when Mark Ruffalo and I went to California to find out about renewable energy, we, we begged him, we said, can you write us a, a plan like the one you wrote that you mentioned on Scientific American for the state of New York? And a year and a half later, they had completed that report. And you can look it up online. It's Mark Jacobson's plan for uh, getting out of fossil fuels in New York. But um, what I wanted to mention was, converse to that, there is a liquefied natural gas port right now, right now, being planned for Jones Beach. And I just and found out about turbines it. turbines there, though. And I think some, yeah, of us, some of us might know that there's a review and a comment period going on. If you go to Gasland's Facebook page and you look down, there are how you can start comment. They're doing this over this holiday weekend. The comment period is supposed to end on, I think it's July 15th or July 12th, for this liquefied natural gas port and all these pipelines. Um, right on Jones Beach. But by, by, by the way, how many people here, just, just applaud to get a, a sense of this, how many people here before you saw this film did not know that the gas industry intends to ship a significant portion of liquefied natural gas to other countries to sell on the open, that they're going to despoil mass, how many of you didn't know that? But they're going to overwhelm and contaminate massive tracts of land in this country and suck the gas out, not so our energy needs will be met and lowered, so they can sell it on the open market overseas. How many of you, so that, that group you didn't know that. But anyway, just one thing I want to credit the film for again, which I, I don't think is bad, and by describing it as a polemic, I'm saying it's part of an important argument, 
is it's raising the energy issue in a general way. And the fact that energy is not free, that it comes from places. Most people, you know, again, walking down this avenue, driving your car, flying, as I did a couple days ago across the country, are not thinking on a daily basis about that energy matters and it comes from places that have impacts. Whether it's Venezuela, Nigeria, uh, the upstate New York, uh, Colorado, Texas, it's something that we don't normally think about. So we've done a great service by elevating, trying to elevate this issue. By the way, one sad reality is there was a poll done by University of Texas, not the part of the University of Texas that got oil money, I mean gas money, that showed that only half of Americans um, have ever heard the word fracking. So I, I think people should see the film and share it and make sure other people see it hey, or it, parts of it get out there. So we can, we can quote you. We're going to... You're going to quote, quote We're going to take a couple of quick questions because this has run late, this program. Uh, but, but, but I also want to add to it, I mean, the, the, the idea that who's kidding who? Who wouldn't want there to be uh, a cheap, reliable, and clean source of, of natural gas in our own backyard? It, it's, it's this idea that we're against this. We, you know, we realize it's an industry, a business. There's going to be a lot of good paying jobs for people. The people who sit on that land, we were in Syracuse, that woman, woman said, are you going to buy me out? She sat there in the front row. That, remember that little kind of loopy woman that was in the front row? And she sat there and she said, are you going to buy me out? The gas company's offering me $100,000 for the gas rights on my property in central New York. And she said, my family needs that money. She said, she said are you going to raise money among your friends to, to buy me out? Now, that was an absolutely preposterous idea, but at the same time, I understood her dilemma. She wanted that money. She needed that money. And, and, and that's part of the division that's been created because the last thing I'll say is this country has always exported a contaminating methodology for extracting oil and gas. We've done it all over the world. <clears throat> There's areas of this world that we have ruined forever. Ecuador, you know, and, and, and Texaco passed that baton on to West Chevron. Virginia. West, right, right, right. And, and now what this gas industry is doing is saying, we don't have to export it around the world anymore. We'll just do it right here. We're doing it in our own backyard. So uh, do we have any questions in the audience? Okay, here we go. Do you have a mic here, Jim? Okay. Hi, this question is for Andy. Um, there are uh, some scientists who concede that uh, fracking can never be innocuous, but still maintain that it's necessary at least for you know, the next 50 to 100 years uh, until the resources are depleted. Um, I'd like, Andy, if you could speak to what the immediate future would look like if the resources that are now put into fracking uh, were shifted to uh, natural, you know, uh, renewable sources. Well... Be a cynic or a skeptical. It, it, uh, which I think you can't help question. with. The, uh, the part of the question, you know, if we, if we had a way to shift this investment that these companies are making in digging holes in the ground and pulling stuff out to advancing the frontiers of renewable energy. And there are frontiers that we still don't know how to store energy in a way that makes it move around like Mark Jacobson would like it to do. Um, wind, at current efficiency of the wind, you would have the same fight. You saw that aerial view of the west. Think of those as wind turbine pads instead of drill pads. There are still impacts. One of the a very smart energy guy once told me, if you love wind, you better at least like transmission, meaning wires, because that power has to move. So, so what we need to do is build a culture in this country that is fixed on the idea that energy matters and that, that resources are finite, but that, that gas in the ground. There was a very valuable point in the movie where the scientists described, uh, no, the, the guy, the congressman talked about this lurching. You know, because we're, but it's not all about, see, the thing that differs, that I differ with other people on is, you know, there's this thought that it's all Exxon's fault, that if they just, if you took away those ads, we would magically not just lurch to the new easy thing. But as a species, we have this bad habit of moving to the next easy thing. We're not very evolved yet. And I would love to see a culture grow that innovation and dissemination of these kinds of technologies is a new imperative in this country. I've written about this repeatedly on, on my blog at the time. Well, if, if you don't mind, there's nothing about fracking which is easy. Um, it's just easy for those companies to push it on us and make it easy for them. It's certainly not easy for the but people who are going through it. But, but um, to that point, I think you're absolutely right. We definitely need, this is, we don't have an energy problem, we have a political will problem, we have a cultural problem. And that's the sort of next stage of my life. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, plan was born for New York. 
Um, we're going to be going on tour with something called the Solutions Project. We're going to try to hit 25 towns in New York State and give you solutions on an individual basis, on a group basis, and on a legislative basis. And that is the next leg of this. Because the truth, the truth is that what we have in these target zones for fracking is something completely new that never existed before, which are people who are imperiled by this continuation of, fra of fossil fuel development, um, you know, and the impacts of which we don't all even understand right now. We do know that people's human rights are being violated. Right next door, it's sort of like, I, right next door they're playing Jurassic Park, and they, they give, it's sort of the same movie as Gasland too, in a way. Because they give birth to these dinosaurs, these fossil fuels. And then they just science completely run over everybody. everybody. And, you know, we, you know, we don't have Jeff Goldblum. But um, the idea, though, that if we don't start making these decisions collectively, if we don't start taking them on, and, you know, I think here, where you're not in the frack zone, but you're definitely in the next sandy zone. And when we're talking about the impacts of climate change, these are no longer abstract. I mean, we left Colorado Springs, two, two weeks later there were fires so hot they were creating their own tornadoes. The worst wildfires in the history of, uh, of Colorado Springs, where my uncle lives, was, were ravaging through. We watched Hurricane Irene wash away whole towns in upstate New York. We're seeing drought, we're seeing record temperatures all across the continent. Um, we have to start to take this on, because the antidote for having your government walk out on you is not to just keep hammering away at the government. It's to start to recreate your own participation, your own representation, your own democracy. And that means energy democracy. It means actually doing it, though. And I would agree with you. We're wasting a lot of energy. And efficiency is a huge part of this. Efficiency is, in fact, worth, is the cheapest energy we can, we can get. And it's worth more than all of the fracking. But, but, but I want to add to that, because you, you, you've made a couple comments now about uh, air conditioners on in East Hampton and people flying in planes and turning on your propane. Are you saying that conservation is more what you think is called for? Oh, we need more conservation. Right, right. And, 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 and we've achieved that how? You have to have policy, too. Right. Um, well, and law in New York City, in 2008, they banned, they said, if you have a store more than 4,000 square feet, you can't keep the door open in the summertime. Uh, law actually came out, and that's not right. here, obviously, in the Hamptons. Right. Just, just, just two points I'd like to make. One Long Island. We don't give a shit out here in the Hamptons. <laughs> Open the doors and put the air. I don't live in New York City. And Long Island they is. go play is, polo. <laughs> Long Island is, isn't disconnected from fracking. The Suffolk County Legislature has passed a law prohibiting waters from fracking, see, from upstate, coming here and being processed in any sewage treatment plant in Suffolk. And just in terms of, you know, this whole notion of, uh, well, the, the problem with renewable energy, frankly, is the sun doesn't send a bill. The wind doesn't send a bill. I and mean, that's the wrinkle here. I have a little house in Sag Harbor, an old salt box, 150 years old. A guy who installs and, the solar panels. But the, a guy installed, once the infrastructure is in, once I gave Majestic Solar and Sons the money to put the solar panel on the salt box, south facing, I mean, I looked at the still called LIPA meter today, and it, it was going backwards. Uh, the solar thermal on the roof providing hot water. But uh, again, the sun doesn't send a bill, the wind doesn't send a bill. So people who want to pedal oil, pedal gas, pedal uranium, those kind of folks want us to keep hooked to the existing well, We're, we're going to take one more question, we're going to go, but I just want to mention, you talk about out here and people with the doors open and the air conditioning, which, I mean, I understand, I guess, what you're saying, but uh, I want to tell you how committed the people of Long Island are to clean energy. You're talking to a group of people who are here who, when they were going to build a nuclear power plant here on Long Island, and Carl Grossman and I work with groups about this, when they were going to build the Shoreham nuclear power plant, they, the, the Long Island uh, the lighting company, the, the precursor of LIPA, said to the residents of Long Island, hey, man, you, you know, we, wanted, we don't want to tear this thing down. We built this nuclear power plant. And yeah, we're, 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 we're over budget by $3 billion. And once we throw this switch and we go hot, the cost of decommissioning and decontaminating this thing is going to even be more. And they threw the switch. Completely, completely awful, disgusting, rotten, hateful, 
cynical thing for them to do. They activated the reactor, and the people this, the, uh, and they said, we're going to pass the bill on to you. We're going to amortize this bill over 30 years. And the people of Long Island said, bring it. We'll pay the bill. And they shut down Shoreham, and they decommissioned it. They decontaminated Shoreham. So we wouldn't have nuclear power in Long Island. And then we were part of groups that shut down the, the uh, science reactor in Brookhaven as well. So we have a completely nuclear free Island. And in terms of East Hampton, renewable energy Long Island, which had all to do with the state report, is headquartered about five, six, eight blocks from here. Uh, this is a place which has been, well, it wasn't just one nuclear power plant. Actually, what Loco wanted to build was seven to 11 nuclear power plants on Long Island to turn Long Island into the parlance of the time, a nuclear park. And the same BS, the same lies you get from the, uh, uh, those yes, fra before. fracking characters came out of the mouths of, in fact, a, a county executive we had at that time said, they lie like they breathe about local executives. I'd say the same about the, uh, the, these fracking people, and it's so wonderful that Josh documented uh, their deception, their deceit. Oh, let's do this. We'll, 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 do we have a question for Josh? Do we have a question for Josh? One last do, Is it for Josh? Okay. Okay. Oh, microphone. Quick. Um, do you know anything um, next week in Long Beach? I think there's a, I heard something about an open forum that the liquid natural gas company in Long Beach is doing some sort of a thing that the public come. Have you heard about it? And do you know I don't know. Does anybody know about this? Uh, is that Adrian? Adrian Esposito, well, is a citizen's campaign for the environment. Will you, will you like stand up and answer this question? About. Okay. Go ahead. Where? So this is about the LNG plant. Yeah. Where, where, where is it being held? It's being held in Long Beach. They don't have the address on you, but if you go on to any, if you just Google Long Beach, if you just Google Long Beach and LNG, it'll come up. Okay. And it's being held by the Coast Guard. The application is made for them. This is an import facility. It's a subsidy pipeline. Okay. Good. Two miles short. And Anybody over here have a question for Josh? Yes, I have a question. I'd like to know how those people felt about not having their own mineral rights. The guy says at one point that we don't have our mineral rights. Sure. When did that happen to them? Well, you know, it's only in a few places right now in the East that you actually have mineral rights and service rights together. Um, in a lot of places in the West, Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, Arkansas. And you a lot have, of other countries. And, 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 a lot, and most other countries, in fact. Um, people's mineral rights and service rights are separated. It's called split estate. And in many cases, people don't even know this when they buy a new property. I was with a guy in Arkansas. He was a Chicago cop. He was retiring down in Arkansas. He signed a seven-page deed just at the bottom, two words, less minerals. He, and then the ga gas industry came on his property, um, drilled 40 or so wells, eventually locked him off the property. Um, he had a restraining order on his own property, and this was a former police officer. This is very common. There's actually a movie that goes in depth about the split estate issues, which is called Split Estate. Um, it came out the same year as the, as the Wait, first gas Wait, the movie, movie about Split Estate issues is called what? Split Estate. <laughs> Good God. And, and it's, worth, it's definitely worth watching. But listen, when you, in New York State, you have a forced pooling law. It's called compulsory integration. If the gas industry has leased 60% of a certain acre parcel, I can't remember how much, and they can draw the line however they want. It's like 100 or, six, or 600 acres. If they've leased 60% of that, they can drill under everybody. Which means that, you know, they have a sort of eminent domain kind of thing going on. And, and the pipelines also, there's a pipeline right now called the Constitution Pipeline. We're going to get it together here in a second. Um, that is going all the way through upstate New York to connect to pipelines which are going to these LNG ports. The, the Constitution Pipeline right next door to the Bill of Rights waste pit. Yeah, right, right. Um, <laughs> And right now, people are trying to uh, oppose that all throughout upstate New York. So these things are yeah. all of our battles that are going together. In the case of God Bless America Cancer. Right. All right. What I love about these movies is they depress the shit out of me. And then Josh and Adam and Andrew are going to take us out with a song. Let's, let's finish with a song. How about This Land is Your Land? What do you think? Let's do that. This Land is Your Land. Are you in? Are you in?
No wonder we don't have renewable technology. We can't even tune our damn banjos here, for crying out loud. So, um, there is a song, John Prine wrote a song decades ago about another resource, coal, and about Peabody, uh, the, the, which is now the world's biggest coal company, which is in C. Oh, I'm in, I'm in G, but is it C? I'm in C, if that's okay. Or I could, uh, you know, I could I'm still off from you, though. They can't even agree on a song here, these two. Oh, so you're playing upside down, so that's a C? Yeah. They can't agree on a key. Chester Dam. I'll be halfway to heaven with paradise waiting just five miles away from wherever I am. And daddy won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County down by the Green River where paradise lay. I'm sorry my son but you're too late in asking Mr. Peabody's cold train has hauled it away. Yeah. 